Good afternoon. My name is John Herbst, and I direct the Eurasia Center here at the Atlantic Council. I apologize for us getting started a little bit late, but I think you'll find the program is well worth it. Since we're starting late, I am not going to introduce our guests. You have their, you have their CVs so you can see them. I will just point out one thing, that's why I grabbed this sheet. You can follow us on hashtag future Ukraine. So that's one way to keep track of what we're up to. Uh, the events in the Ukrainian gas sector remain critical for Ukraine, for the future of Europe, I'd even say for the future of the West. Uh, the gentleman who will speak today uh, Mr. Kavalyov and his associate, Mr. Vitrenko, on our panel are the architects of the extraordinary progress we've seen over the past three years. I literally met with them in my very first meeting in Kiev in June of 14, returning there after eight years, and they laid out their very ambitious plans, which have turned out to be reality. With that, I'm going to turn the platform, oh, I'll invite our speakers up to the panel, to sit on the stage, and I'll invite Andre after they seat, to come up and talk to you. Thank you very much. Please, Robert. And we will sit here as he speaks. Just save time. Thank you, everyone, for coming to today. Uh, I am very excited to discuss with us the progress that Nafta Gas team has achieved for the last three years. As Mr. Herbst mentioned, uh, our team came to Nafta Gas uh, in 2014, so it was exactly the end of March. Uh, we, at that point of time, had our understanding of strategy, what should be done not only in Nafta Gas as a corporate entity, but in Ukrainian gas market as a whole. That strategy uh, was evolving of the time. We were learning new things. We were amending our approach, uh, receiving different feedback from outside environments such as Gazprom, such as European Union, um, such as our international partners. Uh, and uh, I would like to briefly present you where we started and where we managed to get to. Uh, and also I would like to present today our plans for the future and why they are important not only for Ukraine as a country and moreover not a gas as a company, but also for international community, for European Union uh, and for United States interest. Um, this slide briefly summarizes major numerical achievements that Nafta Gas uh, has delivered, that our team has delivered. So we started with a huge net loss in 2014, and Nafta Gas in 2014 represented not only the icon of Ukrainian corruption, but also the major black hole of Ukrainian economy. For a country uh, at the beginning of hybrid war with Russia, maintaining such a huge burden was not only um, unconscionable, uh, but potentially could kill economy as a whole. As you can see, from 2014 to 2016, uh, due to a number of uh, painful reforms, which were combined with reforms in other sectors, such as social security, such as energy efficiency, Nafta Gas managed to get into black. That's, by the way, the name of our last annual report, which shows that we are on the black for the first time for several years, starting from the time when Timoshenko signed or insisted on signing those agreements, which uh, are being contested in Stockholm Tribunal right now. Speaking of effect on the state budget, uh, Nafta Gas has become a donor of Ukrainian budget. And this year, speaking more specifically by the end, of this month, Nafta Gas for the first time will pay significant contribution in the form of dividends, which are close to approximately half billion of US dollars. All that money, uh, Ukrainian government is now capable of spending on social care, on military, on health care, on education, uh, name what you like. And most of that money comes not only from reforming the sector, but also from the fact that Nafta Gas managed to eliminate 
useless intermediaries who were basically sucking uh, cash from Ukrainian economy. Uh, some of them are well known. Those are Swiss companies which were helping, helping in the past, getting gas from Russia and then selling to Ukraine, or maybe supplying some services or equipment to one of our major subsidiary, Ukutransgas. Many people who, not many, but some oligarchs, became unhappy because of that. But overall, the Ukrainian economy and NAFTA gas only benefited. And we also believe that it's important to understand the complexity and comprehensiveness of reform that NAFTA gas team jointly with the government, with international partners, with the parliament undertook. When tariffs are being increased on one hand, you also have to deliver transparency on the other hand because consumers don't like to pay more for something they don't understand. Well, honestly, they still, still don't like it, uh, to be correct to the very end, but transparency of the company, the fact that Naftigas is performing annual audits with international auditors, that we have new corporate governance structure, that we can explain every single dollar that we are spending makes our job much easier and increases likelihood of the fact that society will accept necessity of painful changes. On the brighter side from point of view of consumer and something that NAFTA gas and the whole reform is often praised for is decrease of dependence on gas imports from Russia. We haven't been buying gas from them for two winters in a row. Uh, on one hand, that was due to the fact that Gazprom is permanently trying to overcharge us. On the other hand, it proved a very important fact that if there is willingness true willingness to diversify, if there is willingness to create competition, there is always a way to do so. And uh, that was done, uh, I would say, in a way which surprised even us. In 2014, in our strategy, when developing the plan, we understood we can diversify a lot, but we had to test the market. And the first response we got at that time, for example, from our European counterparties, was that look guys, you won't survive without Gazprom. You have to keep buying gas from them, you have to stick to them, so please be very careful. What helped a lot uh, is exactly the support of our US counterparties. A lot of pressure from US government helped us unlock the flow from Europe, something which technically was not really a difficult solution, but diplomatically and politically was a huge step forward. And that actually was like ice-breaking event. Because when the first big supplier, such as Statoil, came to us and started big deliveries, the whole European market came and said, okay, guys, now we are prepared to deliver. And we believe that this particular element has reached the point of no return. It would be practically impossible for anyone in Ukraine or in European Union to say, now we have to stop this, we need to go back to old practice. It's simply not doable. And the last point, which deserves a separate slide, uh, is uh, our Stockholm arbitration, uh, which recently delivered first result. Recently, we got the first award on supply case, which invalidated Gazprom uh, take or pay claims. And um, also, tribunal ruled that NAFTA gas is entitled for retrospective price revision. Those two decisions by substance are final. They cannot be revised. The final calculation, given the amount of outstanding debt uh, that NAFTA gas has to Gazprom for gas delivered but not paid, will be done this year. And we hope also to receive decision on transit case, probably the same time, where Ukraine has, or NAFTA gas has no downside, but where we are trying to prove that European regulation is fully applicable in Ukrainian transit which means that Gazprom will not only have to change their rules in Ukraine, but this can be used for the benefit as important precedent for changing rules in European Union to unlock the bottlenecks which were created for many years in order to foreclose markets from new entrants, for example. For example, US LNG companies. We also expect that all decisions will be finalized, as I said, this year, which will put an end 
to a long and very difficult dispute between us and Russian Federation, and also in some cases European Union, what is the fair conditions for gas supply and gas transit in Ukraine. We and Gas believes that this separate, first separate award is a big victory, which saved for Ukraine approximately half of annual GDP. And I would like to look back to see what made this victory possible. Speaking exactly of the comprehensive approach uh, that I was mentioning before. So uh, both arbitrations were launched in 2014. At parallel, we started the diversification of our gas supplies. This was one of the major important steps, not only for development of the whole market, but extrapolating experience that Ukraine has with Gazprom in 2009 and in 2006. We believe that we would never get to the end of this arbitration if we did not have the luxury of buying gas elsewhere. I would suggest that what Gazprom could have done, they would simply cut off the gas for Ukraine as they did twice. And until we withdraw our claim from Stockholm, there would be no gas supplies anymore. The next point is uh, gas price and reform uh, reduction in consumption. Uh, this is, was done parallel in developing our Stockholm case. And this is where we also understood that we cannot claim somewhere else necessity to implement proper and fair market pricing until we do it ourselves as our homework back in Ukraine. This is where a very painful and very, uh, I would say, necessary reform on increasing domestic gas, gas tariffs was started. That reform was combined with reform of subsidy to ease the pain for consumers who could not afford and still can't afford to pay the full price. But our calculations show that on an annual basis, that reform alone improved Ukrainian budget approximately by 2 billion US dollars. In 2015, the gas market law was implemented and we are still awaiting for implementation of some critical elements of that law, which we hope will happen this year and which will represent uh, the final stage of very important transformation that the gas market is going through. We are still expecting, for example, for European network code to be implemented in full. We are still expecting all entry point tariffs to be implemented in full. When it's done, then we believe that we will have the right to say that now Ukrainian market will look looks the way that we were designing it three years ago. There is still a way to improve, there is nothing perfect, but that will uh, probably constitute a landmark uh, in, our, uh, in our way to the uh, proper market. Introduction of RAP tariffs, low energy regulator, those also were the measures uh, that were contemplated in 2016. As I mentioned, what is still pending is EU compliance secondary legislation and implementation of unbundling plan. As Naftegaz, we made strategic decision that our gas transmission system operator should become independent from the group. Uh, there should be international partner, either from EU or from US, uh, co-managing the system in the future. And we believe that our best reply to Europe's desire to build Nord Stream 2 is an option which Ukraine can suggest. And that option is quite simple, is that our system is three times more capable, it is reliable, and with partnership with European companies, it represents a much better choice for Europe. Because by choosing between route, which is fully exempt from European regulation, and is fully managed by Gazprom, and looking at Ukrainian traditional route, when it becomes fully compliant with, with EU regulation, and will be managed by joint consortium of European, hopeful US, and Ukrainian companies, it's a much better choice. That's our proposal, and this is one of the things why we came to ES this time to advocate for this option to be put on the table so that there's not just simply saying no to Nord Stream 2, but there is a better choice which can be used for the benefit of all parties. This probably is a map that uh, describes uh, in the nutshell what I was just discussing. 
So I guess to save time, we will move further. And um, here I was also want to say thank you to our US partners. We very much appreciate what you have done with us. And what I said in the beginning, we definitely wouldn't get where we got without your assistance. We also believe that achievements of nafta gas, for example, our transit case, for example, new unbundled operator, can become an element which can serve to mutual interest, or not only mutual, but multilateral interest of Ukraine, of European Union, and of US. And that is a pragmatic way forward to resolve our problems in the most efficient, most transparent, and most fair way. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Andre, thank you. We'll now proceed with the, with the panel, and then we'll have a chance for the audience to ask questions after our panel. We have a moderated discussion. Is this thing on? Yes. Great. Okay. Uh, Andre gave us a wonderful introduction into the impact of the Stockholm decision. Yuri, as a, a co-architect with Andre of the changes that NAFTA has brought, how do you see the Stockholm decision um, influencing gas developments in Ukraine, the gas market, production, and so on? Let's start with uh, uh, the most obvious thing. Uh, should uh, NAFTA gas lose uh, on take or pay claims? Uh, as Andre mentioned, it would mean that half of Ukrainian GDP uh, should be paid uh, to Gazprom. Uh, it also means that uh, NAFTA gas would be bankrupt. It would also mean that uh, uh, Gazprom would withhold all the transit payments. So they would just, we would transit gas for free. Uh, repaying this debt. It would also mean that Gazprom would become a proud owner of Ukrainian production assets. Uh, you can guess yourself if Gazprom is really interested in uh, producing gas uh, in Ukraine. Uh, and again, unfortunately, it was a very realistic scenario because, again, there was a contract under Swedish law, and in this contract there was a provision on uh, take or pay. So uh, this particular award by the tribunal <coughs> Uh, it's final, it in sense that the tribunal uh, said that uh, all Gazprom claims failed and uh, the tribunal also said that the whole uh, provision on take a pay in our contract was unconscionable. Again, it's a separate story what it means in like more broader sense. Um, also, since the tribunal said that uh, Gazprom uh, had to revise the price, so basically he recognized our right for price revision, and this price should be revised uh, to a European level starting from uh, April 2014. It means not only that NAFTA gas is entitled to retroactive compensation from Gazprom, but it also means that gas price in Ukraine, at least at the wholesale level, uh, will go down. Because currently uh, the price uh, of gas in Ukraine at the wholesale level is at the hub, uh, German basically price plus transmission costs uh, a basis, and it will be just the German price. So again, the saving will amount to this cost of transmission from German market to Ukrainian market. Uh, it, uh, its turn, it means that uh, Ukrainian industry will become more competitive because uh, if, for example, Ukrainian chemical plants uh, have to buy gas at the price that is higher than in the German market, then they're less competitive to, for example, German uh, chemical plants. Uh, surprisingly, a German, a big German company that is very big in uh, chemical production in Germany, it's BASF, uh, they have their own subsidiary Winterschall. Uh, Gazprom is a shareholder of BASF and Winterschall is a shareholder of Nord Stream 2. So you can probably guess how important uh, for these companies is to be competitive in terms of gas sourcing. Also it means that no more, uh, at least we hope so, that it will also cause some changes not just in Ukraine but in the whole region, in Central Eastern Europe. Because we proved in our case that instead of some political agreements, companies like Naftagas can go to, again, to arbitration and get a fair price without any political concessions. And we do hope that our example will encourage 
countries like Hungary, for example, or, I don't know, uh, Slovakia, other, Bulgaria, Serbia, um, uh, all these countries that were historically very much dependent on Russian gas, and they thought that the only way f to get a fair price is to give some political concession to Russians, now they all understand that, again, there is another way. And just to conclude on this point, uh, in general, it's quite remarkable in terms of uh, uh, a shift from 100% oil indexation in our formula, in our long-term contract with Gazprom, to 100% so-called gas-to-gas uh, competition. Um, and I don't want to sound too technical, but it also means that in general, uh, gas industry in Europe, Europe becomes much less political and much more kind of like a, an uh, ordinary commodity market. And it may mean that Gazprom will have less uh, opportunity to use gas as a political weapon rather than just to sell uh, the commodity. Okay, thank you. Um, but do you want to comment on the impact of Stockholm broadly? I mean, yours done some of that, but is there anything you'd like to add on this? Um, sure. Well, besides the, um, the benefits that have already been stated, avoiding a, a huge payment of, uh, of money and also the, uh, the competitiveness that this helps uh, for the Ukrainian economy. Um, there's also the essential principle that Gazprom can no longer unilaterally set a so-called market price. And this will reverberate uh, throughout okay. Europe, as you mentioned. I think also very importantly, uh, this could well lead to competitive competition from domestic production. Uh, for too long, Ukraine has had a, a great disparity between prices, and this has hurt the uh, domestic gas production in Ukraine, uh, either because people can't afford uh, the prices that Ukraine pays for imports, and the, the domestic producers are the ones that get caught paying the, the uh, lower regulated prices that have existed in Ukraine. Um, what Ukraine has really needed is to be able to pay the domestic producers the same price give them the same revenues that they are paying for their imports. And this does that. And Ukraine has uh, considerable resources, especially in tight gas. Now, this is conventional tight gas, uh, not the shale gas that Ukraine also has. But the tight gas is in tight reservoirs and requires the same techniques as shale gas horizontal drilling, uh, fracking, but you get a lot more gas from each well and you get it for a much longer period. So I think we're going to see uh, Ukraine move rather quickly toward self-sufficiency self in uh, gas, gas production and consumption. Uh, Andre's presentation spoke about um, Stockholm as a, in a sense, and, and Yuri's comments as a liberating device for the energy market. At the same time, his presentation spoke about the gas pipelines coming from Russia around Ukraine um, as a way of Gazprom maintaining a hold on the energy market in Europe, not quite consistent with market principles, let's say. So what do you think about that, but about, about Nord Stream 2 in particular, especially in light of the vote of the Senate? Please. Well, the, uh, in light of the vote of the Senate, there is more uncertainty about North Stream 2. There's going to still be a lot of uh, resistance uh, to U.S. efforts to, to stop the project. Uh, so that's got to be worked out. On, uh, on paper, North Stream 2 has a, will have a capacity of about 55 BCM a year. Uh, Turkstream will have a capacity of about 31 and a half BCM when completed. Uh, so on paper, they could they could replace the 
80 plus BCM that is now transited or that was transited last year uh, through, through Ukraine. That probably won't happen because of the um, demands of the market uh, geographically, but they could replace uh, most of the transit through Ukraine uh, if they are built. Um, importantly, they won't be um, able to do that by 2019, which is the, uh, the time that we're going to need a new transit agreement between Ukraine and Russia. So that will still be out there to contend with. Um, let me mention for the audience so it's clear that the Senate voted 97 to 2 last week for additional sanctions on Russia for a variety of reasons. Um, one of the clauses in the, in the draft bill that was passed by the Senate spoke about um, sanctioning activity to build, um, in effect, Nord Stream 2. This prompted um, a strong reaction in, in Berlin, uh, where, by and large, the German government is supportive of going ahead with Nord Stream 2. One of the arguments made by the Germans is that this step by the Senate and by the way, the House has to pass it before it becomes law, and so there's still a ways to go. But one of the points made by, by the German government in arguing against what the Senate did was that, in fact, this was an effort by American um, hydrocarbon producers who now have liquefied national gas to increase their market. Um, Robin, I was wondering if you have a comment on, on this subject. So I, I think one of the arguments that you heard was that the U.S. was, um, that you've heard in some of the press, out of Europe is, is is this sanctions legislation because all the U.S. cares about is not really European energy security but promoting U.S. LNG exports. And it's interesting because um, we've been supporting European energy securities as long as I've been in the State Department. Actually, early um, 1990s, we supported the Baku Tbilisi Jehan oil pipeline, um, which didn't have a single dollar of U.S. investment in the early stages and most of the later stages. We're huge supporters of the Southern Gas Corridor. Again, similarly, it's not, doesn't have uh, many major U.S. investors in the, any of the pipelines that bring the Caspian gas to Europe, um, which goes to say that we've been supporting European energy security for decades, bipartisan, um, because we care about the security of our partners and allies in Europe. Um, and even when we started talking about gas diversification in Europe five, six years ago, United States we weren't an LNG exporter, and most analysts thought we would never be. We were still looking at import terminals, um, and there was an estimation that we would be one of the major LNG importers um, in the world by 2035, when in fact now we're poised to be one of the world's greatest LNG exporters. So long-winded answer to say um, we support European energy security first and foremost because we care about the security of our partners and allies in Europe. A second related point to that is the U.S. government doesn't direct where U.S. LNG exports go. And we don't tell our companies where to sell their cargoes or where to establish their long-term contracts. Um, we're thrilled that the U.S. energy industry has been so successful and that U.S. LNG will be hitting the market. And in fact, whether or not Europeans buy U.S. LNG, I think that there will be a positive impact on Europe either way because we are contributing to a better supplied, market-oriented, competitive global LNG market. Uh, we've approved 220 billion cubic meters worth of gas to be exported to free trade agreement and non-free trade agreement countries. Most analysts think somewhere around 100 BCM will hit the market in the next five years. It's a tremendous amount of gas, and it is going to be good for gas buyers everywhere, in Europe, in Asia, anywhere. If I may, please. And from an economic point of view, sometimes we feel and we see that it's not a level playing field uh, in Europe, basically, especially uh, if it concerns Gazprom. Um, it's fair to say that Gazprom currently gets some uh, st state aid, basically, or Gazprom transit to Europe is subsidized and it gives unfair competitive advantage to a Gazprom over US LNG. Ironically, the state that provides such a state aid is Ukraine. Because the uh, transit tariff that uh, uh, we were charging, or we have been charging to Gazprom under the current transit contract, is too low. 
it does not uh, reflect our costs. It's basically below our cost base. That's what we're trying to change through this arbitration. So when we are able to charge a, a cost reflective tariff, when we are able to make Gazprom comply with uh, uh, Ukrainian and European mandatory law in Ukraine, because as you m probably know, Ukraine transposed um, a European energy key into Ukrainian legislation, then uh, Gazprom won't have uh, this illegal state aid and these subsidies. And then let's see how Gazprom can compete with US LNG. Also, again, Nord Stream 2, one of the major um, reasons for this project is to create some access capacity for Russian gas transports uh, to Europe. And with such access capacity, marginal costs of Gazprom will be rather low. They will be able to undercut, again, uh, for closing the competition, they will be able to undercut US LNG imports. And it's not in the best interest of European consumers. So from that perspective, when some of the Europeans are complaining that you, the U.S. government is pushing too hard. In fact, they should recognize that the U.S. government is pushing for a level playing field in Europe. Okay, and just to elaborate, in your judgment, gas, um, Nord Stream 2 is bad for European consumers because? Because, again, uh, it will be able, Gazprom will be able to foreclose competition in the European market so and because uh, uh, basically um, on top of security uh, concerns, and they're very, very serious, basically, it just distorts uh, the market or it allows Gazprom to manipulate the market. All right, that's clear. Um, but given your widespread knowledge of the energy market, is there anything you want to add about LNG as a factor here? Um, yes. Um, LNG, well, the, the chief benefit to global security of US LNG will be increasing the overall supply. And uh, as we have seen, there are lots of new customers for LNG, and there are some misconceptions about how US LNG is, is bought and, and sold. Uh, primarily, all you need to get US LNG is the infrastructure connection to an import terminal, which isn't, isn't too hard. Uh, one of the misconceptions is that you need a long-term contract with Chenier, which is the only major US exporter now. Uh, that's not true. Chenier makes many uh, spot sales of LNG. Uh, Poland's recent uh, purchase was a spot cargo. Also uh, Spain, Portugal, uh, Italy, and Turkey have also bought spot um, purchases, cargoes from, from uh, Chenier. About um, one third of their total cargoes so far have been spot sales. Uh, beyond that, uh, you can get cargoes from the portfolio buyers. The largest buyers of US LNG are part portfolio that resell the gas uh, where it is most demanded. Uh, so those are, are two easy ways to get the LNG. Okay, thank you. Returning from the international markets to Ukraine, um, Yuri, again, NAFTA has really led the way on reform in Ukraine. Uh, one of the purposes of the price reform was to lead to increased production and more foreign direct investment. Could you, what do you think is going to happen in this area? We already see uh, the fruits of uh, this reform. So uh, last year, we were able to stabilize uh, uh, production. This year, it's expected to grow. 
uh, by 5%. Uh, that's an optimistic scenario by at least by 3%. And that's a lot uh, for such an industry as uh, gas production, uh, especially if you're not in the US, when, uh, where gas production is more like a technology business with huge advances every year to surprise everybody. Uh, since we're more traditional or more obsolete, unfortunately, uh, it's not uh, happening that fast. But still, again, uh, we are growing. Um, uh, unfortunately, it happens uh, uh, only basically um, in uh, our own subsidiary, Ukrgas Debuvanya, and not on the private side. And uh, um, there are a num there is a number of issues, basically, or barriers uh, to development of upstream in Ukraine still. Um, so, because this price differential that we all talked about uh, was relevant only for uh, state gas producers, basically for nafta gas and the nafta gas subsidiaries. Uh, private producers enjoyed uh, market prices that were 15 times at some point higher than uh, prices we got for our uh, uh, gas. Uh, so now when we have this level playing field, again, our production is growing fast and uh, we expect to grow our production by 30% uh, over the next uh, three years. At the same uh, production of private players is flat. Um, unfortunately, with all due respect to private players in Ukraine, uh, they're not like international innovative uh, companies. Uh, they're more like local players uh, with all the strings attached. Uh, there are many flippers, basically people who got licenses, but they're not using these licenses. If you look at uh, outstanding licenses, uh, private players uh, have about the same uh, volume uh, uh, of the reserves, but they produce three times lower. Uh, just because they're not professional investors, they, some of them just stole these licenses under the previous uh, regime. Not some of them, but many of them, unfortunately. And again, it's, it, it should change. Uh, from our side, in our new uh, strategy, you can see it in our annual report, we defined our mission as uh, to be an engine uh, for uh, modernization, and there is a word, uh, a word I, I can't pronounce, internationalization, internationalization, that's, that's something good. like that, basically, yeah. Uh, basically, to bring international companies, to help bring international companies to Ukraine, because it's much more difficult than it sounds. Uh, in order for international companies to come to Ukraine, you should have a proper investment climate, you should have some ecosystem, meaning that there should be service companies around, there should be geological data available. So all, the, all this uh, nitty-gritty details or nuts and bolts of uh, an industry development. And we believe that we should play uh, an important role in it. And as soon as there is an efficient market for gas in Ukraine, uh, the state uh, should really work on uh, stepping uh, out of this market. So basically, again, the current role is to uh, develop the market and then when the market is there the state uh, again should through the partnerships through different other strategies should st should step out and in general just to conclude uh, uh, we say that in our strategy that uh, nafta gas uh, should be ready uh, for an ipo uh, in the next uh, couple of years uh, then the government will decide about that but it's very important, again, that uh, we show to international investors and to domestic investors that there is a blue chip company that is in the black with a very clear and a sound business model, uh, which can be an attractive um, investment. All right, let me follow up on that and then turn to Robin. Uh, for, for, what you, for the vision you've just laid out to happen, mm -hmm. you're going to have to navigate the populist backlash in Ukraine to the change in gas prices. So I'd appreciate your sense as to how that will play out. And also, you need to have a, a proper um, corporate board, which is another important issue right now on the reform agenda. So if you could comment on those two things. Uh, for sure. Uh, again, this fight with populists, it's, it's a very big fight and very difficult fight. Uh, first of all, because we have very strong populists in our country. Uh, uh, fortunately, unfortunately, not just in Ukraine, uh, but in Ukraine it's uh, like a real disaster. But also it's uh, because uh, uh, we had this, um, we call it like oligarchy, kleptocratic uh, uh, model or social contract basically, where people treated the state uh, 
as uh, not their representatives, but something given by, I don't know, uh, by heavens, basically, that owe something to these people. So again, very kind of uh, wrong social contract. Uh, it should be changed, and it is the whole transformation of, uh, uh, as one people call it, extractive institutions to more kind of inclusive institutions, will also mean that uh, uh, people will uh, uh, choose not populists, but basically, again, their representatives that can really make the reform uh, happen. Somebody like you know, Macron, for example, now in, in, in France. Uh, at the same time, uh, it's very difficult to fight with populists, uh, um, for example, for nafta gas, uh, when uh, we don't have a lot of arguments uh, to say that the fight with corruption inside Ukraine is an efficient one. So it's much easier, basically, to say, look, yes, we had this very painful move from hidden subsidies to targeted subsidies, but it really eliminated corruption in the gas sector. You see that people go to jail, bad people go to jail. You see that the state is getting wealthier, and it allows basically Ukraine to defend itself, it allows again to develop infrastructure, all these wonderful things. Then people see the benefits of these reforms. If you see, okay, so populists are bad, but at the same time you can't demonstrate a significant progress in terms of fighting corruption, then you have a very weak position. Um, and speaking of corporate governance, again, as Andre mentioned and as you, you mentioned as well, it's all interrelated. interrelated. So the idea of the corporate governance reform was to show uh, to um, Ukrainians who are ultimate beneficiary owners of nafta gas, because the government is just the agent, basically, of Ukrainian people. So to show to them that, look again, uh, we do not steal, we are different, we are accountable to you, and the, all the money that we, that we earn, again, all these billions of profits, uh, basically, it's your money, it's not our money, so we're doing it for you. And it's a much like more efficient, it's, it's a fair way, basically, because of providing hidden subsidies uh, to people with huge uh, mansions, basically, who consume a lot of gas, we basically get this money to the state budget and then we distribute it in a, a fair and transparent way. Uh, again, this corporate governance reform that we initiated uh, is now to some extent is put on hold, uh, but we do believe that it's just a temporary kind of uh, uh, problem and uh, the government will recognize that it's, it's in their interest to get trust from their own people um, and to advance in, in, in terms of this very important reform. It's actually reassuring to hear you say you think that this problem with the boards is a temporary one. And this is for the audience. Uh, just to repeat, the, the leadership at NAFTA has, has not been shy about laying out the difficulties they run into on the reform process, even if that discomforts their superiors in the government. So Robin, the US has been an important partner, as has, for that matter, the international financial institutions, the EU, and Ukraine's reform. So I'd appreciate your take on the, where reform stands now in the energy sector, and, I mean, in the, in the gas sector in Ukraine. Yeah. I I'm glad you asked that because I think sometimes we lose sight of just how far Ukraine's come and just what the government and Afghanistan in particular have achieved. No, Andre gave the figures, but I very, very clearly remember in 2014, um, not, this is spring of 2014, not long after Russia, the Russia crisis began. We were sitting in a room, very smart analysts, where we were talking about how do we make it so that Ukraine can choose to buy Russian gas and doesn't have to buy Russian gas? How, you know, is there a timeline for this, for achieving this? And one analyst said, well, could we do this in five years? And somebody else sort of scoffed, huh, five years, impossible. There's too much to do. Well, Andre gave the figures. They have, you, um, Naftha Gas hasn't pur purchased Russian gas since November of 2015. Um, and it was through a combination of reforms, the reverse flow from the neighbors, from Slovakia, Hungary, and Poland, making longer-term contracts with international companies like Statoil, um, the corporate governance steps that NAFTA gas took, serious hard reforms that really did pay off. Similarly, the RADA passed extremely important um, legislation with the natural gas market law, the electricity market law, um, the regulator law, and there is more to do in terms of implementing legislation, but very important progress. And I would also say that looking at domestic production, because it's an area where um, my bureau, the Bureau of Energy Resources, does provide assistance to the upstream subsidiary of Naft Nafta Gas, UGV, on domestic production. A 30% increase over the next couple of years, incredible. 
And I think that the steps that you're taking in UGV to, to make that a reality um, are going to pay off for Ukraine. So extremely impressive reform. Yes, there's more to do. Um, uh, there's more to do on unbundling, as Andre po pointed out. Uh, this implementing legislation, there's more to do. The subsidies is going to be a tough nut to crack. It always is. But Ukraine's on the right track, and the U.S. government will continue to stand with Ukraine as they undertake these reforms. Uh, Robin, I can't pass up the opportunity having you here, and I think the audience will appreciate this, to ask you how you see the Trump administration's approach to hydrocarbon policy in Ukraine and more broadly. So maybe broadly, uh, that if I had to characterize the Trump administration's international energy policy, it really centers around three core pillars. The first is removing barriers to energy trade globally. The second is um, the energy security of our partners and allies, as well as our own. And the third is the promotion of US energy exports, the full range of exports, resources, technology, commodities, um, its services, et cetera. So if you take that sort of broad outline and you look at Ukraine, you can see a real synergy. What we've promoted in Ukraine is an open, competitive market, transparency, um, a market where all companies can compete, including U.S. companies. And so I'd like to say one word about um, Russia and Russian gas. The U.S. has never been opposed to Russian gas entering Europe. I mean, we, Russia and gas can, should, and will be a part of Europe's energy picture. Um, but what we've always said is that like everybody else, Russia needs to play by the rules, by the market rules. Um, so I think in terms of the broad outlines of President Trump's energy policy, you, it very well fits with our policy toward Ukraine. And Secretary Tillerson has made it clear in his testimony on the Hill, as has Vice President Pence and others, that our commitment to Ukraine is unwavering. Thank you. Um, but I'll give you the last word. If there's anything you want to add on this or not, then we'll turn over the audience questions. Oh, why don't we go to the question? Okay, good. A modest, a very capable man. Okay, please, questions for the audience. And please identify yourself. Uh, thank you for holding this. My name is Andrei Sitov. I'm a Russian reporter from uh, TASS here in Washington, D.C. Uh, thank you, Mr. Vitrenk, for, for giving a very good overview. Uh, you mentioned uh, that you want uh, Naftagas uh, to come to an IPO in, in the next couple of years, two or three years. And at the same time, as was also mentioned in the panel, this will be the time when you need to renew the transit agreement. Uh, with the Russians, because my understanding is that the profits that you mentioned mostly came, or almost all of them, uh, came from the transit fees. So my question is very simple. Are, are you already talking uh, about renewing uh, the uh, agreement, the transit agreement? Uh, and what, what happens if there is no agreement? What happens to your company? What happens to the uh, gas network in, in Ukraine? Thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, just to remind everybody, uh, Naftagaz is very serious about so-called unbundling. And unbundling means making the transmission system operator separate from Naftagaz. So when we say that we need to be ready for an IPO over the next two years, it means that we need to be ready for an IPO without gas transmission. But we, uh, Naftagas, is a group that uh, combines uh, or includes not just gas transmission, but also sizable gas production that we are growing now. It's also about oil production. It's also about oil transmission. It's also about uh, uh, gas retail, uh, fuel retail in general. Uh, we're now uh, going to become much more serious about renewables, about energy services, about the utility side of our business. So the IPO is focused basically on this side of our business. Now let's talk about the gas transmission side of our business. So as I said, again, uh, the plan is that we make it completely separate from Nafta Gas. Uh, we also said that it is in the best interest of Ukraine and Europe and, in the, uh, and the US to have a JV, a joint venture, to operate Ukrainian gas transmission system. So not it just should be different or separate from Nafta Gas. Again, it should have a very strong Western partner to operate the Ukrainian gas transmission system. Why we need it? Uh, first, we need uh, a Western partner to uh, make this uh, whole gas transmission infrastructure or to some extent gas market much more modern, 
in terms of commercial technologies, not just technical, I mean, technical side of this business, because a proper European market is a hub where, again, uh, with like a very liquid market, uh, with an electronic trading platform, again, electronic booking platform, again, all that that uh, uh, is kind of uh, differentiate a proper European transmission system operator from uh, Uker Transgas, our subsidiary, which is more like a service company or a repair shop. So they employ 20,000 people, but uh, uh, 2,000 of them are responsible for repairing compressor stations and 1.2 thousand people, they work in agriculture. So it's not a modern TSO. We're saying that, again, there should be a very modern TSO with all the modern commercial technologies. Also, we say that it's very important to attract a foreign partner so that European off-takers of Russian gas are compatible with the Ukrainian gas transmission system. Because uh, there was a lot of uh, Russian propaganda saying that Ukrainian gas transmission system is in very bad shape. Actually, we have seven times less incidents per 1,000 kilometers than Russians have in their system. So from that perspective, our system is in good shape. But at the same time, of course, European off-takers, European companies, uh, they are now uh, used to much uh, very different, basically, market setup or market operations in Europe that they see in Ukraine. So that's why it's important, basically, to have a Western uh, transmission system operator working in Ukraine so that European off-takers of Russian gas are completely comfortable with our gas transmission system. And then, what is also important, it's very important that European off-takers start moving delivery points of Russian gas to Ukrainian-Russian border. Because it used to be the case when Russians were telling Europeans, look, don't worry about transit over Ukraine. Ukraine is like a very diff it's a mess basically, so don't go there. We will deal with this mess. Now everybody sees how efficient Russians are with dealing in this mess. Uh, so again, it's kind of obvious that Europeans would be much more efficient in making sure that Ukrainian gas transmission system and Ukraine as a whole is a rule of law and is a proper country. So from that perspective basically, again, uh, Europeans move delivery points of Russian gas to Ukrainian-Russian border. Then gas business in this region becomes really like a commerce, not, not politics, basically. Russians don't have any risks connecting with uh, uh, Russian transit, basically. And uh, Ukraine, as a gas transmission system of Ukraine, uh, will get revenues from European companies. They, they will use uh, Ukrainian gas transmission system if they want, basically, to transport gas, to, to store gas in Ukraine and then send it to you know, Italy or Turkey or whatever, or to trade gas in Ukraine. So as Robin mentioned again, the whole idea for European market reform, that it's not governments who should decide what companies should do, basically. We should create an environment where private players or state-owned companies, whatever, commercial enterprises, will decide what is in their interest and how they can get money, make money, basically, servicing their clients. Uh, we would, uh, as Naftagas, again, we also don't dictate who will be a client for our gas transmission system. Personally, I would very much prefer European companies to be a client of Ukrainian gas transmission system rather than Gazprom or any Russian company, but we don't discriminate, basically. If Russians want to book capacities of Ukrainian gas transmission system, let it be so. But again, we would personally prefer basically European companies uh, to book capacities. Okay. What is dependent on Russia is that Russians don't abuse their dominant market position. And if European companies want to change delivery points to Ukrainian-Russian border, Gazprom says, no, we will dictate where you get our gas. If that happens, then we would expect DG competition, European antitrust authority, to step in and to say, sorry, but in Europe you have to play by market rules and you can't abuse your dominant market position. You can't dictate European companies what to do for a closing competition. Next question. Please. Hi, it's Doris Ombri from the Embassy of Hungary, and I have a question related to the potential of Ukrainian domestic production because it has uh, been said that it's increasing. And um, so, beyond Russian gas and LNG, can Ukrainian gas be a third player eventually, like or in the coming years? Yes, Thank we you. expect to start exports of, of Ukrainian gas uh, into neighboring countries from 2020. So we will start with uh, 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 
very limited volumes, uh, but in general, we see a huge potential for Ukrainian upstream. Just talking some numbers, now we produce about 20 BCM of gas. We used to produce uh, 60 BCM of gas. Uh, Ukraine, again, built a new pipe, a first pipeline to transport gas from Ukraine to Moscow, basically. So not vice versa. And uh, the first export pipelines of Soviet Union were built to, tr to export Ukrainian gas to neighboring countries like, for example, Slovakia uh, and, again, Central European countries, Czechoslovakia at the time. Um, also, if you look, for example, at uh, history of gas production in Texas, uh, there was, again, uh, a dip in production. Uh, but then when new technologies became available, in Texas at least, uh, gas producers were able basically to get to the uh, previous level. Uh, that's why it uh, um, allows many experts to believe that Ukraine can get around to the same level of production that we used to enjoy, again, in the middle of the previous century. So then we would be talking of 60 BCM per year. But even to be much more conservative, we expect that Ukraine can produce about 27 to 30 BCM, uh, again, in the next uh, three uh, years. And with some expected energy efficiency gains, it will allow us to start exports uh, to neighboring countries like Hungary. Yuri, just, just, just to clarify, you said 2018, correct? You, uh, you, uh, starting from 2020, that's kind oh, of 20, 2020, yeah, all right. Yeah, yeah. So in 2020, you expect Ukrainian gas production to be what? And Ukrainian gas use to be what? Uh, we expect our gas production to be 27, 28, and we expect our gas consumption to be 27, 28. But because of some fluctuations, basically, in the, uh, demand and uh, supply, we should expect at least half a billion uh, cubic meters of gas to be exported. Also, we should take into account our storage. I don't want to sound too technical, okay. but uh, uh, we, again, in our plans, uh, we expect uh, s like a slow start of exports uh, from 2020. Okay, thank you. Next question. Vidratenka from Voice of America. Could you uh, comment on the plans uh, of creation of a Ukrainian Polish gas hub? Uh, how realistic are those and uh, uh, how important this will be for the region? Uh, we are very open to all uh, opportunities like this. Um, unfortunately, just being a market practitioner, uh, I must confess that. Uh, uh, creating a hub requires not just like like technical infrastructure. It also requires uh, rule of law, basically. So people should trust uh, uh, this hub uh, to have their contracts basically signed uh, there. Uh, they should trust the regulator basically to kind of regulate uh, uh, trades in this particular market. And it requires more time. Uh, also, if you look at um, the history of Central and Eastern Europe, now you see some hubs, for example, in Austria. Uh, you may even say that there is a hub in Czech Republic or in Slovakia, uh, but they're not liquid. So that's why Acer, a European, uh, there is also a hub uh, even now in Poland, but that is why Acer, for example, is pushing for um, some um, combination of uh, markets in these countries to create a more or less kind of uh, a united like virtual hub or something like that to promote liquidity. Uh, because what we see at the moment that actually in, in Europe in general, uh, liquids hub uh, are just in Germany again and it's again, gas pool uh, in the Netherlands, TTF and in the UK. All other countries, uh, they could not create really like a liquid hub. So, and we're open to opportunities, but uh, unfortunately, it's more difficult than one can expect, in our view. Other questions? Right here. Uh, first of all, Please identify yourself. I wanted to say congratulations with winning the arbitral proceedings in Stockholm. And my question is about the enforcement proceedings, which is the next step after getting the favorable award. When do you expect to start the enforcement proceedings and in which jurisdictions and what do you think are the prospects of and such proceedings? And you are? Uh, I'm Victoria Kornevich from US Ukraine Foundation here in DC. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, for the separate uh, award, the issue of enforcing is not particularly relevant for the following reason. Because uh, Gazprom claimed uh, $45 billion for take-a-pay, uh, the tribunal ruled that uh, these fails fail. 
uh, these claims uh, fail. But it means that they cannot get this money out of us, and that's why, again, they can't enforce. Uh, there is no ruling that they could enforce. Uh, in terms of interactive compensation that we're entitled to, first of all, experts should calculate and agree, or if they cannot agree, the tribunal will decide on the, on the, on the amount of this interactive compensation. But this compensation should be offset against uh, uh, the debt uh, from our side to Gazprom for gas that was taken from Gazprom but not paid. Uh, we're talking about uh, uh, second quarter of 2014. Um, again, it's too early to judge uh, what the balance will look like of these payments, but we don't expect a big amount uh, uh, to uh, any of the parties, basically, uh, in favor of, of uh, any of the parties. Uh, th this question will be relevant if we win the transit case. Because in transit case, we claim about $20 billion of retroactive compensation and about $16 billion of its uh, value of future claims, basically. The difference in, in the tariffs that Gazprom will have to pay for uh, transit of gas via Ukraine. Over there, enforcement will be a relevant question, but we don't expect Gazprom not to honor decision of the uh, tribunal, because it will be an end of, to their business model in Europe. Again, all long-term contracts, not just of Gazprom, but of many uh, gas companies, they're based on the expectation that decisions of the tribunal will be honored. Uh, also, again, Gazprom has no sovereign immunity, unlike, for example, the Russian government in Yukas case. Uh, Gazprom has many assets in Europe. Gazprom delivers gas to liquid markets, for example, in Germany. And it's not that difficult, basically, to enforce any decision of the uh, tribunal uh, in European countries. They recognize this New York Convention. Uh, and then, again, the, you can go after this liquid asset. So we don't expect, to cut a long story short, uh, Gazprom not to honor uh, the decision. Next question. All the way in the back. Thank you. Uh, I'm Leonor Fontora with the EBRD office here in Washington, D.C. Uh, the international financial institutions and development banks have had uh, an important role to play during these past four years, or three years and a half, um, on the, the promotion of the reform uh, efforts and the financing of the reform efforts in the energy sector. So question for the panel is, how do you see in the next couple of years, how do you see that role? Should it be the same? What do you see as uh, that should change? I'm interested in your views. But you want to try that? Are you asking? Well, yeah, go ahead. Let me start off by saying uh, I think the role should continue. It's um, apparent that uh, the financial institutions have been helpful. Um, they have, uh, in particular, lent uh, money to pay for gas for Ukraine, and you know that that burden should uh, ease in the future uh, as Ukraine makes continued progress with um, reforms and uh, increases its, its own gas production. Um, yeah, but I think it's, it's still vital. There, there's no doubt that continued strong interest and support from the international community, starting with the international financial institutions, but including the EU and the United States, is absolutely critical for reform in Ukraine for the following reasons. First, as Bud mentioned, there's a need for material assistance. But second, equally important, you have, Ukraine is at a pivotal period in its history. It has an active civil society that is pushing the country in the right direction. It has young reformers in the Rada and in the government who are not at the most senior levels, but at in important positions, who are also pushing the country in the right direction. But it has a top leadership which has one foot in the future and one foot in the past. And they need that encouragement coming from the outside. 
Uh, I don't know if anyone else on the panel wants yeah, to add, please. Special th thanks to EBRD. So EBRD, uh, the role of, of the EBRD was very important, basically, in the transformation of naphtha gas and gas market as a whole. Um, EBRD provided $300 million uh, as a revolving uh, uh, trade finance facility for gas purchases from the West. Um, what is even more important, EBRD played a crucial role uh, alongside the U.S. government uh, uh, in pushing for the corporate governance reform in order to insulate uh, NAFTA gas from political meddling and graft. It's not over yet, but uh, we do see, we do look at uh, the BRD as a very important partners basically in this fight. Uh, also, uh, EBRD, together with the European Investment Bank, uh, uh, provided a loan facility for modernization of Ukrainian gas transmission system, which is a very good argument uh, for all uh, the, uh, or against the propaganda that the Ukrainian gas transmission system, again, is such in bad shape, and uh, that's why Nord Stream 2 should be built, because otherwise Europeans won't get, uh, won't get their gas. So we demonstrate to the whole world that uh, on top of it, it being more reliable that the Russian gas transmission system, we have enough uh, funding already kind of uh, available for all the modernization that is uh, necessary. So that's why we think that the role of EBRD in particular is very important. But generally speaking, of course, uh, without uh, um, IFIs, uh, uh, again, these reforms would not be probably possible. Yeah, yeah I couldn't agree more. I think continued interest and involvement of the international financial institutions will be essential and has been critical in the past. And I also think that the coordination among the IFEs and between the EU and the United States has been very important. And transatlantic unity um, and support for Ukraine, not only in the energy sector, but in other sectors, as well as uh, transatlantic unity on our sanctions against Russia until Russia, Russia meets its commitments under the Minsk Accords has been essential. Next question. Well, going once, going twice. Uh, if you don't ask another question, you have to go out into that. Beat the traffic. I mean, yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, I'd like to thank our panel for an excellent discussion and Anzi for his wonderful presentation.